excited that um, you know I get to present with my good friend Sean. So I think uh, hopefully the talks will be. I know his talk will be great. I hope mine is also good. But um, yeah, I'm going to be telling you uh, a little bit about the work that I've been doing today um, with uh, Ryan and Mike, and then another undergrad, uh, Matthews, um, who uh, uh, has been doing a lot of the sort of validating simulations. And so it's been a really good chance to work with him. Um, and so, so let me make sure it can go. All right. So uh, there are four main things that I kind of want to touch on today. Um, so briefly want to give a little bit of a background on demographic inference. I want to spend a little bit of time of talking about sort of how I think about the difference between auto polyploids and allo polyploids and how that comes into doing demographic inference. And then also um, after that, look at uh, just a brief case study and some of the stuff that we're doing in an allo tetraploid, uh, Brassica napis and then finish up with just a brief um, bit of looking forward um, for how we can think about making these types of inferences. Uh, yeah, so a paper that I really like and that I read early on as part of a, a class that I took during my PhD uh, when we were sort of talking about demographic inference is this uh, paper from Fagundes et al, which is a 2007 PNES paper. So it's a little dated at this point, but um, it does a really nice job of illustrating, comparing different models of um, human evolution. And so as one of the first papers that I saw also that sort of does these, what you think of as canonical illustrations of demographic models where you have different populations splitting off from one another, you can have changes in population size, you can have gene flow. Um, and so when I think about demographic models, these are the types of things that I usually think of. Um, and in this particular paper, um, they use uh, coalescent simulations and approximate Bayesian computation to explain these different models. And so the way that demographic inference works in sort of an ABC framework is you have your model and you have the parameters of the model. You put prior distributions on those, mo on those parameters. Um, and then you basically just do a ton of simulations and you use those simulations to generate some informative representation of what genetic variation should look like under that model with those parameters. And so in the past, people have typically used summary statistics, but there are a lot of sort of machine learning approaches that are, that are sort of emerging to do the very similar things. Um, and then you calculate those same statistics in your observed data. And the idea is that once you produce enough simulated data and you save enough simulations that are similar, that produce summary statistics that are similar to your data, you'll get an approximated posterior distribution for the parameters of the demographic model that best explains your data. Um, and then this kind of contrasts with um, what is done more frequently now, which is where we can do demographic inference with actual likelihoods. And so the two most common approaches are uh, this FASTSIM cold 2 approach, uh, and then also uh, an approach from one of my postdoc labs that my postdoc advisor Ryan developed um, called DADDY. And so the way that these differ um, is that FASTSIM cold 2 generates approximate, an approximate distribution of expected derived allele frequencies for multiple populations. And so the way that it does this is it uses coalescent simulations to approximate um, the expectation Whereas with DADDY, um, it uses diffusion theory to get an explicit probability for what that expectation should look like. Um, and so in general, these two different approaches are the ones you'll most likely see, and they have different underlying machinery, um, but both methods calculate likelihoods using the expectations for the site frequency spectrum um, that is generated by a given demographic model. And so whenever I talk about site frequency spectra, I usually like to start um, with kind of a, a lower level introduction to, to what it looks like and how we think about it. Um, and so if you're thinking about building a site frequency spectrum, um, it's usually started with you know, an alignment. So maybe you have a VCF file or something else. Um, you might have an outgroup and then some sampled chromosomes from your population and you're comparing um, the number of derived mutations that you see compared to the outgroup. So in this um, illustration, we have a number of sites, and then some of them match the outgroup, and then different mutations occur, uh, have different frequencies across the, the alignment. And what we do is we can go and count the number of times we see uh, derived mutations of different frequencies. And so we can kind of step across and see, well, these match the outgroup. We have the singletons. 
we have the mutations with frequency two, three, four, and five. And then the number of um, possible mutations that you have is um, basically just a function of the number of samples that you have from the population. Uh, and so in general, what the site frequency spectrum will look like in this example that I have here is you sample 20 individuals and then you just look at either a histogram or this dot plot of the, expect the expected value for the number of mutations and of each frequency that you'll see. And so in this case, this is what you would expect in a neutral model. Um, if you have something like a bottleneck, this whole thing will drop because you have a reduction in genetic diversity because the population has decreased in size. And then if you have something like a population expansion, you'll see the entire thing shift upwards because when you have more individuals, you have sort of new genetic material for mutations to arise. And so you'll see more rare variants or more low frequency variants in the population. So as a little primer for demographic inference, um, we'll bring it back to actually thinking about it more so in polyploids. And so in this case, you have um, changes in the ploidal level, but also you can think about different formation pathways of the polyploids. So you might have a polyploid that forms by splitting off from some ancestral diploid population. Um, and so we you know, usually think of that as being auto polyploidy. And then we have, uh, a tetraploid formed by, from hybridization followed by whole genome duplication, which you know we, uh, canonically is this allopolyploid situation. Um, and something I'm going to touch on a lot more is that things can get much more complicated when you have you know sort of hybridization or some type of separation between the subgenomes, but they interchange at some frequency. And so um, you know this could be a segmental allo tetraploid or some type of di diploidized auto tetraploid. Um, but usually I visually think about it as something that has somewhat separated genomes that can exchange over time. Uh, so getting into the sort of nuts and bolts of thinking about autopolyploids and allopolyploids, um, I think a lot of the time, especially when people are working with, um, with polyploids, one of the first steps is kind of, can we bin these things into one or the other category with autopolyploids being duplicated chromosomes, all from a single genetic background and allopolyploids being a polyploid with two different genetic backgrounds uh, with the assumption that for the most part, they don't really interact ever. And so we sort of treat them separately. Uh, in reality, I think these are probably more of the edges of a spectrum of, of polyploids. Um, where you know on one edge you basically have chromosomes that freely exchange with one another and um, you have basically all of the expectations of an idealized auto polyploid where things are basically just multiplied by two so instead of you know sort of having a diploid you have a tetraploid but a lot of the i guess in the math or modeling world you would just multiply by two for most things uh, and then this is also in sort of on the other side of the spectrum, there's the allos where you don't multiply by two, but because they don't interact with one another, you basically just genotype on the two separate ge the separate genomes, and then you treat them as if it's a diploid um, in all of your analyses after that. Um, but I think in general, there's a lot of other things going on for polyploids like homeologous recombination or different types of mixed inheritance patterns that sort of fill in the middle of this spectrum. And that's where most actual polyploids probably lie. Um, and so when we were starting to think about building models, um, and so just in different discussions with, uh, with Mike and Ryan, um, the simplest one that we could think of is a model for different polyploid subgenomes, uh, with the idea being that you know, even if you're an auto polyploid or you're an allo polyploid, sort of on the edges of this spectrum, you, know, you have subgenomes that have been that have been duplicated and so you're either the original copy or the duplicated copy or sort of from the hybridization and then these subgenomes can exchange genetic variants through recombination at different rates um, and so you can also think about having different numbers of subgenomes so, you know a tetraploid might have two a hexaploid will have six uh, and so on and so forth and the way that these, so I just call them DIJ, um, the way that they fit into this sort of spectrum perspective is that 
The DIJs are the frequency that you have exchange between the different subgenomes. So in an auto polyploid, they're always exchanging. So the exchange rate is basically one. In an allo polyploid, the exchange rate would be zero. In a pure allo polyploid, there's never any mixing between the different homeologous chromosomes. Um, but then these parts in the middle have some parameter for this DIJ that is between zero and one. And so this kind of inferring this parameter is something that we've been trying to build into models um, to infer, to figure out basically, is it a pure auto polyploid? Is it a pure allo polyploid? Or can we infer some parameter that shows that it's in the middle? So just to summarize this little section and think about calculating the site frequency spectrum in polyploids, the way that we think about their subgenomes is we can treat them kind of at least in a modeling framework as different populations. And then we model their interactions kind of like gene flow between populations, except this time it's exchanges between homeologous sets of chromosomes. And then because they're all within the same organism, they all are subject to the same demographic history, but then the, the uh, variants along the subgenomes are all combined into a single site frequency spectrum in the end. And that's what we end up trying to model so getting into the case study a little bit, I just want to show you some of the things that I've uh, actually been trying to do with Brassica napis, which is a, a pretty well-known allotetraploid hybrid between Brassica oleracea, so things like uh, Brussels sprouts, kale, kohlrabi, um, and cauliflower, and then Brassica rapa, which is uh, things like turnip, and then Brassica napis itself is um, the crop that makes canola oil. And so part of my postdoc has been to use this system to sort of test out ideas about demographic inference and then also use the demographic history to try and model the process of domestication and also look at things like selection on different important um, uh, traits for napis and things like that. So napis is a hybrid between oleracea and rapa and so it is composed of the the A subgenome from Rapa and then the C subgenome from Oleracea. Uh, and so when, we're, when we were analyzing this, um, we started doing some maybe unconventional bioinformatics uh, for, this, for this species. And so the typical thing that people do for NAPIS is they basically map any sequencing reads that they have back to the full set of chromosomes. So all 19, uh, nine from Oleracea and then um, 10 from the Rapa subgenome. And so what we wanted to try and do was, well, was to map resequencing data. So we selected 20 individuals to either just the A chromosomes or just the C chromosomes. And so the A and C genomes are pretty closely related to one another. And so um, I have a figure and a couple slides here that will show how sort of the homology and syntony is conserved between the A and C genomes. So we wanted to see if we could treat treat Brassica napis as if you know we only had one of the representative subgenomes and see how that would work. Um, and so for this approach, we sort of did the normal mapping, um, sorting, and QCing, and uh, marking duplicates like normal, and then calling SNPs and GATK. But when we call the SNPs, we treated them as if they were tetraploid because you would think all of the reads from the C genome that have sort of homologous positions in the A subgenome should map to that same position. As you might guess, it ends up being a bit messier, but that was the idea anyway. Um, and so what we ended up doing then was using variants on either chromosome A1 or chromosome C1. And so we wanted to kind of compare and contrast between those. Um, so as I mentioned, um, part of the reason why we wanted to try this and think about this is, so this is a syntony plot between, uh, so the A chromosomes are um, marked AN1 through 10, and then the C chromosomes are marked CN1 through 9. And so uh, AN1 and CN1 are the, these pink ribbons, and so they're pretty much almost completely syntonic with one another. And so we thought that those would be good chromosomes to start with for trying to do this type of comparison, thinking about treating NAPIS as a tetraploid. Um, so after doing all of that and building the safe frequency spectrum, um, 
first, I want to remind you what a normal site frequency spectrum looks like before I show you the ones for NAPIS. Um, and so in a normal site frequency spectrum, you expect sort of the frequency of variance to go down um, as they increase in frequency. For the A subgenome and the C subgenome, we have site frequency spectra that look like this. And so at first glance, these probably look pretty horrendous, but they actually do show patterns that you would expect to see. Um, and so one of the patterns that you can see is that there's a peak in, well, at least close to the middle of the site frequency spectrum. And as you might expect for an allotetraploid in particular, um, if the subgenomes don't interact that much, then SNPs that are homologous between the subgenomes but never actually are exchanged between them uh, will be able to fix separately. And so this peak in the middle is actually a, a peak of fixed heterozygosity between the subgenomes. And so you, you see an overrepresentation of 50% frequency variance, which is what you would expect to see. Um, in the C subgenome, you actually see another peak at about three quarters. Um, and so part of the reason for that, I'm going to get to in a minute. But another thing that you'll see is that the peak in the A subgenome isn't exactly over 50%. It's a little bit to the left. And so something that we've been thinking about a lot is how much of sort of the deviations or the patterns that we're seeing are due to things that are actual biology versus things that are, you know, that we can deal with using bioinformatics, basically. Um, and so the other thing that we wanted to look at is we're treating this not as sort of two separate subgenomes, but we're trying to treat it as if it is a tetraploid. We're calling tetraploid genotypes. And so we do, when we do this mapping, does it actually look like this species is a tetraploid when we do this? Um, so we use this, this program called Enquire, which just uses um, the read ratio frequencies at hetero, heterozygous positions or heterozygous SNPs um, to try and figure out it's basically a proxy for, for SNP dosage in genotypes. And based on the patterns of, of read ratios, you can tell if it's a diploid, a triploid, or a tetraploid. And so when we did this, we were hoping that it was going to look like it was a tetraploid. And these plots are um, a little confusing, but the red line is the average across all 20 individuals. Um, and so one of the things you can see is that there's a ton of variation among the individuals. So each blue line is a single individual and then the red is the average. Um, and so across the chromosomes, there's a lot of variation in what the ploidy level looks like within a 500 KB window. And then also, um, unfortunately, the consensus doesn't really look like most of the windows are tetraploid. There's sort of a mix of a lot of different things where all the different individuals aren't really showing the same thing. And so on average, it looks almost like it's a bit of a triploid. Um, and so part of this is definitely gonna be driven by issues of remapping and bioinformatics and things like that. Um, but there are other things that are probably leading to patterns like this, which um, is the fact that Brassica napis is both a recent and an ancestral polyploid. And so, uh, the tribe Brassici, which um, is, you know, Brassica napis is a member of, experienced the whole genome triplication in the past, and the duplicated genomes still remain. They're rearranged and they're fractionated, but they're still there. Um, so one of the things we've been thinking about a lot is how do we deal with this repeated duplication of the genome when making inferences about demography? Um, and so, this gets into the kind of looking forward section a little bit as I'm trying to wrap up with time here. Um, and so a little bit of shameless self-promotion. Um, I had a really great opportunity to work with uh, Mackenzie Mabry, Gavin Conant, and Chris Pierce to write a review um, about integrating different approaches for making inferences in um, polyploids. And so two of the things that we focused on a lot was this idea of leveraging phylogenomic information and also population genomic information sort of together to try and make better inferences. So using information about sort of the phylogenetic relationships, not only among species, but also among um, like blocks of, of the genome and how their, how their history of duplication and things like that 
how phylogenomics can be used to relate them all to one another to make better inferences about um, about demography and just species relationships in general. And so uh, what I've been thinking about a lot recently is using syntony or phylogenomics or other approaches to identify homologous regions of the genome to make sure that we're comparing like with like basically across not only polyploid species but diploid species too. Um, I think this is true for not only SNPs, but also for sort of the more macro genomic or pangenomic features of the genome, like presence, absence variance, or copy number variance. Um, making sure that you're comparing like with like is extremely difficult and also extremely important. Um, and so when we're able to do that, or as new approaches become available to be able to do that, I think that these proper comparisons will help us a lot to be able to start building links between polyploidy the sort of demographic uh, consequences of whole genome duplication, whether it be bottlenecks or whatever else, and then also selection on um, sort of post whole genome duplication um, genome evolution. Yeah. Uh, so with that, I just want to acknowledge uh, lab members. So of the Barker and Kuntz lab, I uh, definitely want to thank uh, the members from the annual review paper that uh, I got to be a part of. Um, so Mackenzie and Gavin and Chris, and then the National Science Foundation for funding. So uh, thank you all very much for your attention. And I'm, I think I have a bit of time for some questions. All right, well, well thank you, Paul. Um, as usual, go ahead and pop your questions in the chat window. And uh, if you'd like to turn on your audio and video uh, to ask it, feel free. It looks like uh, Boas is up first. Uh, with a question. Yeah, so I can either read it or, um, so yeah, so are the, are the patterns observed on Braskinapis chromosome one present on other chromosomes? Are there specific differences? So uh, I've built site frequency spectra for Braskinapis in various different ways. Um, this is the first time I've ever just looked at a single chromosome. Um, and so, my suspicion is that, so chromosome one and then chromosome two, um, they can serve syntony pretty well with one another, but then after that, they tend to break down a lot. And so I would expect that there is differences between chromosomes based on the retained patterns of ancestry across the two subgenomes. And so you know, like, I don't, this is not a real pattern, but say that, you know, chromosome, five and the C subgenome is broken between chromosome nine and chromosome three and the A and the A subgenome. Like making sure that you're comparing those types of things um, correctly based on their ancestry, I think is at least, at least how I imagine that it should look when you're trying to build the safe frequency spectrum. Because when you have the the extra layers of duplication on top of everything else, you end up getting really, really weird site frequency spectra with peaks in odd places that are being driven by actual biology, but it's just difficult to uh, suss them apart if you're not if you're not explicitly modeling sort of the older stuff. I think looks like the, Justin's got the next question. Justin. If he wants to pop on video and audio, it always helps to make it feel a little more interactive. <laughs> Come on down. Or I mean, I, I'm happy to read it too. So yeah, so yeah, so Justin's question is, could you speak a little bit more about why you wanted to only map to the diploid instead of polyploid reference? Is it only to estimate the DIJ parameter or is another reason why? Um, so there are a couple reasons. Uh, one of them is early on, we wanted to see if we could build models for polyploids that didn't make any assumptions about whether it was auto or allo. And so if you're recalling a SNP, you call a SNP as if it's coming from just a tetraploid. It doesn't matter which form it is. And then um, basically the model with those DIJ parameters will be able to hopefully tell you based on patterns in the safe frequency spectrum, how much exchange there is between subgenomes. And so if there's a lot of exchange, then it's probably auto. If there's barely any, then it's probably allo. Um, and also removing the restriction of having a reference genome is really nice for you know, people who don't have reference genomes. Um, and so that was sort of some of the motivation, but yeah, for NAPIS in particular, it makes a lot more sense to try and map it to both all at once. And so this was kind of testing an idea and it ended up 
it showed a lot of things that were useful, but it was also um, pretty messy in some ways too. Okay. All right, looks uh, like, uh, yeah, so Ob 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 Obadu. Yeah, so uh, I think it's important to distinguish between homeolog exchange and ancestral polymorphism retention across the two parents. Are you considering including haplotype length to distinguish between those or any other ideas? Um, so that's a definitely a good thing to consider. Um, so with the demographic inference approaches, the ancestral polymorphism thing would be dealt with because you're modeling modeling frequencies within populations rather than assuming that things are fixed. Um, but at least the the approach that we use in DADI assumes unlinked SNPs. And so the haplotype length makes it much more, like we wouldn't be able to incorporate that into the models that we have right now. Um, I can imagine how you might do that. So there are a lot of the, the hidden Markov models, like the pairwise sequential Markovian coalescent family of things um, that might be able to be tweaked to, to look at that stuff more explicitly. Um, but I don't know of anybody that's working on that, but maybe there is. I wouldn't be surprised if there is. Um, so yeah, I don't, hopefully that answers your question. Um, and then uh, one, yeah, one last question here from Camille okay, before from we Camille, switch yeah. up talks. So would it be possible to figure out ploidy per region using coverage supporting individual variants? Okay, would it be possible to figure out ploidy per region using coverage supporting individual variants? Um, So the way that I did it with Inquire was just the first thing that popped into my head. So I would not be surprised if there are other approaches that might work better than what I initially did. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and say, yes, I assume it is possible. Um, and yeah, I'd be happy to talk more about thinking about how to infer local body levels. Okay. Um, do I have time for the last two or maybe we should switch over to Sean? And then well, I think there's actually time for but those last two, if you're not too, if you're too quick, they seem pretty related. So okay, um, uh, was there ever evidence for more than two alleles? Uh, Inquire seems not to be able to deal with the situation. We see this sometimes in both alleles and autos. Um, so yeah, so Inquire can't do more than two alleles, um, and I think yeah, I haven't dug in enough to know to look at multi allelic uh, variants. Um, but I think that that would be a good thing to look at and you would probably be able to disentangle things a little bit more. So that's a good point for sure. Um, and then are there pattern, are the patterns observed on Nebraska Napus chromosome one also, oh, sorry, that went all the way back up to the top. Um, but the genome contributions from the two ancestors of Nebraska Napus, it's an equal, how is this affecting the site frequency spectra and demography if there is unequal possibilities for recombination? Um, Yeah, I think um, maybe at the end, if there's some time, I'll think on that question because I'm not, I don't want to dig into Sean's time. So um, sorry, Rob, but I'll think about it. And then at the end, I'll give you an answer if that's okay. <laughs> that's perfect. I think that works. Okay. But I think Rob, yeah. stick around. <laughs> okay. okay. Yeah. Stay through my talk. Yeah. Sorry, Sean. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> All right. Well, um, yeah, we'll let the, uh, Paul, the uh, drop sharing there. There we go. And let Sean take over. Um, I'm still sans video here. So if you're wondering why you don't see me for those that came in later. Um, uh, so we'll let Sean go ahead and share his screen. Their screen. All right. Uh, okay. Uh, is Perfect. Great. It, look, it looks good, Sean. All right, well, our next speaker I'm happy to introduce is, is Sean Abrams. Uh, Sean uh, is a PhD candidate at the University of Missouri, Columbia, in the Peers Lab. In 2014, Sean received their BS at Botany at the University of Florida, where they worked on several projects, including ecological niche modeling in the lab of Pam and Doug Soltis. Uh, after graduating, Sean spent a year as a, a post-back uh, research assistant for the Everglades Foundation, studying the effects of sea level rise on Everglades plant communities. For their graduate research at Mizzou, Sean is focused on the evolution of metabolic traits, 
and the impact of gene duplication on the, the development of key innovations, which will be the focus of their talk today. Sean's postdoc plans include applying for the NSF Plant Genome Fellowship, but is keeping their ear to the ground for other opportunities as well. So um, here's a great chance uh, to hear about uh, Sean's recent work and uh, hope maybe make a great connection for a postdoc. Uh, so with that, I'll let Sean take it away. So, Okay. Um, yeah, and if at any point um, there's uh, an issue or anything with the screen, let me know, and I'll try to address that. So um, the role of polyploidy in the evolution of the brassicaceae and key innovation. Uh, so I started this work um, uh, as a part of uh, uh, an extension on the GRP fellowship that I had. Um, so all the analyses that you'll see today uh, were done in the lab of um, Eric Schranz and uh, in the Netherlands. Um, I also gave the first results from this talk at uh, polyploidy with last summer, which seems uh, not a year ago. <laughs> um, but I'm really happy to be able to, now that the paper's out, um, give the updated version on what I've been doing. Um, so glucosinolates, or mustard oils, they are considered a key innovation of the brassicales and um, of the brassicaceae especially. So these are what we know as uh, yellow mustard and wasabi, um, but also make up the taste profile of a lot of um, common uh, crop vegetables. Um, it's also a taste profile for uh, many insects and this um, back and forth coevolution uh, has been a classic model um, in how these plants escalate their glucosinolate compounds. So there are over 170 different types of glucosinolates um, and how these insects, uh, specifically uh, in Pyrus and Pyrus butterflies, are able to um, take advantage and denature those glucosinolates um, for their larvae. Okay. So they're not just delicious for us, they're also delicious for the bugs. Um, in uh, 2015, uh, our lab put out a uh, Edger et al. Um, demonstrated a, a, a relationship between escalation and rates of speciation uh, in the brassicales associated with innovations in glucosinolate compounds and also paired that with um, phylogeny of the uh, insect clades that are doing the same thing and mirroring that. If you haven't read this paper, I highly recommend it. Um, but uh, what they focused on were some key shifts in the starting substrate um, of the glucosinolate and how that uh, attributed to the innovations that we see. So specifically, the origin of indolic glucosinolates, which is this purple here. And that just means that it starts with a tryptophan um, amino acid. Um, and then the origin of methionine-based glucosinolate. So it starts with a methionine. Uh, amino acid. And if you're unfamiliar uh, with biochemistry or with um, glucosinolate uh, specifically, which is probably a lot of people, the uh, way we can think about this um, pathway can be broken up into three different parts. So you have um, a section that is chain elongation, and then the formation of the core glucosinolate structure, and then novel structural elaborations that get tagged on the end after you've already made an official glucosinolate. Um, if we're thinking about it, I often like to uh, imagine a car uh, in these cases where, so if the, these before chain elongations or maybe you're um, altering the materials that go into making the car, and then you're actually making the body of the car, and then you're adding the cruise control or a fancy paint job or different things that really sell the car in the end, right? Uh, and in um, the Edger paper, so they were focusing on specifically the formation of this core glucosinolate structure. And like I said, on which amino acid substrate uh, gets added. And this expansion was tied to the beta duplication event, uh, where you can see a duplication primarily of the cytochrome gene family. Um, and that allowed for uh, the pathway to start picking up uh, novel amino acids, in this case, tryptophan, um, and then Later, we see another duplication event um, that is not a specific polyploidy event, but that it is uh, results in methionine-based uh, glucosinolates getting picked up uh, for into the pathway. Uh, so going back here, so the 
um, we can see some of the key sh uh, rate shifts occurring right here at this node and the origin of methionine, which couldn't have happened unless you had um, duplicated the indole glucosinolates at the beta duplication. And so, haha, so we've found the origin of uh, the key innovation in the effects. But um, what they didn't look at were potential effects of the alpha duplication, and especially considering there's a huge um, shift in speciation rate um, right at the base of the, the core brassicaceae. So is there something, um, with my question, is there something uh, that the alpha duplication is doing that contributes, that contributes to glucosinolate diversity in a similar way uh, that the beta duplication did? Um, so going back to our, our car metaphor, uh, two of the major um, uh, QTL uh, for the pop at the population level for glucosinolate diversity are AOP and MAM. So AOP, you can think of um, as these novel structural elaborations at the end. It's the paint job. It's the um, the uh, cruise control. I just got a new car, so I'm stuck on the amazingness of cruise control. Um, <laughs> uh, and then uh, MAM, which is uh, acting in this before part, so the chain elongation step. But um, because the chain of the methionine amino acid is extended, uh, we actually also get um, more opportunities or opens up the chemical space basically for novel structural elaborations at the end, right? So when we're thinking um, back to that Edger paper, a lot of the, what we might think of as um, novel structural elaborations are actually a result of this MAM uh, opening up that ability. And so the way it does this is by adding a carbon here um, on the methionine compound. And so you might get um, one, three, four chains with each one adds a different potential chemical functionality. Um, and the way this looks, or looks, it doesn't look, the way this is, if you use a LCMS to analyze the glucosinolate compounds, you can see that you have uh, majority profiles um, in like Arabidopsis, for example, 3C, 4C to 8C. Um, and in Brassica, uh, you would have 3C to 4C, um, and then you'd have 3C and 4C. So this is the, the majority of the carbon chain lengths um, that you get extended to. And in, in this case, you can have um, profiles that display um, dual properties, which is um, so a difference in phenotype. But we don't, we, um, don't really know exactly what is causing those differences, um, but I have some hypotheses. Uh, so then the um, primary uh, metabolic, metabolic ancestor, so the thing that MAM was duplicated from, um, has been known to be IPMS. Um, but the actual order of duplication and, and how this occurred uh, has, uh, was not really well known. Um, we knew it was some sort of duplication type, but we weren't sure, oh, are they different because MAM was duplicated separately from both of these or if they share duplication and then diverged after that. Um, and although polypoidy is uh, the point of the seminar, other gene, uh, gene duplication types are playing uh, into the action that we see um, at the MAM locus. So near tandem duplications, um, transposition duplications, and whole genome duplications. Um, and certain genes are bound by these dosage constraints. And um, actually, I believe in the paper that uh, Paul mentioned, uh, the review paper they did, that they use this metaphor to, uh, to think of uh, the stoichiometry of gene dosage, and that if you're making a cake, um, certain ingredients you want to double, say salt, um, and if you double the amount of salt, you get a salty cake, and maybe you don't like salty cake, but if you double um, the sugar, you just get a sweeter cake, and you might want to keep that. So in the same way, there are certain genes that want to be duplicated and work fine, and certain that don't, um, and can only be duplicated after something like when you duplicate the entire recipe, um, which would be, in that case, polypoidy. Um, so the goals of uh, this study were to characterize the role different gene duplication types have played in the expansion of this gene family um, and the origin of MAM, um, and then place those understandings in the uh, context of phylogeny. Um, to do this, um, I did a micro uh, network analysis um, combined with phylogenomics um, based off of the, uh, the, the pipeline of uh, Tao Zhao. Um, and basically what you're doing is you're creating uh, a networked synteny database. So you're taking multiple genomes um, and you're comparing their synteny uh, to 
make a network of all the different shared regions. Um, and then you're taking that and putting that in the context of phylogeny. So here you have the phylogeny and then you've placed the syntony on top of that. And it can tell you a little bit about each of the different gene families or parts of your gene family uh, that exist. Uh, to do this, you first need to identify um, the domains that you're specifically interested in, in uh, for this gene family. In this case, BAM, the thing that's doing that chain extension um, is the H, uh, HMGL-like pyruvate carboxylase. Uh, this, uh, this in IPMS exists, so this is the square box here, um, but in IPMS they also have um, this leucine allosteric dimerization domain. So what that means is this is what allows the protein that results from IPMS to become a homodimer and interact with each other. So it wants to match up with another very similar protein um, and then that is how it's um, the pathway uh, begins. And so this is actually involved in uh, leucine uh, biosynthesis. Okay, so, um, oh, first I apologize. I copied these from an older presentation. And so now I've transitioned from squares to circles, but um, hopefully you, that doesn't confuse you too much. Um, so the, if we're thinking about, okay, so what does it mean to compare the syntony of these different regions? If I were comparing the IPMS locus to our MAM locus, um, we understand um, that they have uh, similar syntony um, but when we compare their syntony, they don't actually show, or we, I should, uh, sorry. So we understand that they have shared ancestry, but when we compare them directly um, because of divergence, um, we actually don't get syntonic signal between these two loci, whether we're comparing within the same individual genome or um, between other genomes, right? Um, and even if we shift down, uh, maybe we still don't necessarily see a syntonic match um, but if we look at something like the Cleomaceae and we compare that to a Bra um, Brassicaceae, uh, which has this, um, which interestingly has retained the leucine dimer domain, um, though that has not been characterized, um, we can see, oh, so it, there isn't a match there. But if we just shift our window, our gene frame, um, we're actually able to see a syntonic match and get um, blind connections in our syntonic network. Um, and uh, likewise, if we compare between these groups, so the Cleomacy is acting as like a uh, missing link um, for understanding the, sy the syntonic origin of these two loci. Um, and then putting that in a phylogenetic or phylogenomic context, um, uh, we take those findings and then um, place them in the tree and then hopefully we can indicate um, when these specific uh, duplications occurred in the phylogeny, but also potentially when the loss of this um, domain uh, also occurred. So uh, actual figures. So here is the, uh, what we find are three, uh, three syntonic clusters. So an IPMS cluster. So all the IPMS from all, uh, all 35 genomes used in this analysis um, do uh, show syntonic uh, syntonic relationships to each other, and it's actually very strong, um, which indicates that it, there's there's selection at this locus for making sure that this region of the genome remains the same and uh, purifying selection on local duplications for IPMS. Um, and that's just not the case for MAM. Uh, MAM is uh, uh, the ancestral MAM locus, um, has shows a lot more variation, um, but still syntonic uh, uh, relationships. We also see a novel um, cluster that seems to be a result of transposition. So now you have a, a, a secondary um, locus that is doing MAM things potentially, but at, so acting in um, trans to the, uh, the ancestral locus. And this is also very specific to um, lineage two um, of the Brassicaceae, so our Brassicas and um, those members. If we zoom in, so this pink bar here is the Cleomacy, and uh, we can see uh, what I kind of described earlier is that these genes that are um, in effect uh, MAM 
uh, MAM genes. And so they, they do cluster. So phylogenetically, they are MAM genes. But these MAM genes are showing synthetic relationship to these IPMS um, loci uh, in multiple different species, not just the Cleomaceae. Um, so in this, I kind of wanted to look a little deeper. OK, so what's going on? Um, in the Cleomaceae, we only used um, three genomes uh, to do this. So it was a lot easier to visualize than the Brassicaceae was. Uh, so with this, we can estimate uh, that the ancestral mam locus, by the time we get to the Cleomaceae, so there is an origin at the beta duplication for mam. So beta duplication is doing much more for glucosinolates than we potentially thought um, at first, uh, in, in that it's originating this very important locus. Um, but we also see tandem duplications uh, that are uh, that are already occurring there. So there's some sort of subfunctionalization that's allowing for this ancestral mam locus to um, to break away from the dosage constraint or the full dosage constraint we expect with uh, uh, IPMS. And then these mam-like genes in the Cleomaceae, um, again, they have yet to be functionalized, even though they include. Uh, or functionally identified or characterized, um, even though they include this um, leucine dimer domain. So we don't know biochemically what's going on. Um, we do see that this locus in the Cleomacy behaves like the locus in the, uh, in the Brassicaceae, and that there are a lot of tandem and local duplications that are occurring. So there, you do get losses and um, novel genes occurring, although they tend to stay in this um, number four, uh, four total dosage. Now, again, we need to sample more genomes in the Cleomacy to make sure that this is a pattern that sticks, but so far it seems to meet um, our expectations of MAM, um, if, if, if that is a little restricted. Um, and then if we look at the theta um, hexaploidy event, so following the, the, the theta duplication uh, for uh, gynandropsis and Terranea, um, we actually see a reduction in this, so a duplication of the IPMS locus. So IPMS duplicates again, um, and again, IPMS likes to be duplicated at whole genome duplication and nothing else, right? It's our salt in our recipe, um, and the uh, and there is a, a a compensatory loss. So, so you're still dealing with, and here in gynandropsis, four genes. So you have four total genes in the gene family, four total genes in the gene family. That's, you know, that's interesting. That's nice. We want to see how gene dosage is potentially affecting this, um, this uh, missing link of a MAM gene. Um, and then, but in Terranea, although uh, we do see these, uh, four, um, these four genes, there's actually a fifth gene that is added. Um, and it is a, transpo it's a transposition that has lost the domain. So this is pretty good evidence that it's a specific domain, um, or we hope that it's pretty good evidence that the specific domain is what is tying is that the necessity for that protein to create a homodimer that is restricting MAM from doing more duplication and then therefore giving us some of the crazy phenotypes that we might see in the, uh, in the Brassicaceae. Uh, yes, and these genes aren't just there, they're also um, expressed and in fact, this gene here is our transposed gene, and it seems to be more highly expressed in the uh, in the leaf than in than these other mams are. So it's doing something potentially. We uh, but again, we have to do more functional um, analyses to figure that out. Um, and then quickly, just compare to um, the Brassicaceae, which again is much more complicated. Um, but I really appreciate that um, the setup for the uh, the Brissisi hexaploidy <laughs> that Paul gave me. So um, so this is just what I've told you so far. So it looks like the IPMS locus was duplicated in response to the beta duplication. So MAM owes its origin to the um, beta duplication, um, and then uh, IPMS is again duplicated uh, at theta, but uh, the um, duplication of MAM does not occur at theta event um, and doesn't occur until later a transposition that loses that leucine domain. Uh, and then if we want to look at the alpha um, duplication, so again, 
uh, we see IPMS is duplicated. So everything in the Brassicaceae has two IPMS loci um, because of the, uh, this alpha duplication. But um, there are also, as we know, plenty of um, duplications in the history of the, um, in the history of the Brassicaceae. Um, but the MAM locus isn't duplicated at the alpha event. It's actually um, stays a single copy and only becomes duplicated at the subsequent um, events like the Brassici uh, hexapoidy. Uh, so this leads us to summarize that at this locus here, following, um, or excuse me, locus, at this uh, point in the phylogeny, following the alpha duplication, that is when the loss of that leucine dimer occurred. And that is what allows for um, a lot of the expansive gene duplication to occur in subsequent polyploidy events, but also other gene duplications uh, in the Brassicaceae. Um, this is uh, emphasized by the fact that in the, uh, in the Brassicaceae, the hexapoidy event, so um, Paul talked about how, oh, there's this ancestral hexapoidy, and because of that, in something like NAPIS, you wouldn't know, you know, are these uh, are these genes because of this NAPIS duplication? Is that because they're duplicated, or is it having to do with the more ancestral duplication? And how do you separate that? Well, in this case, you actually get multiple, because of that triplication, multiple ancestral loci. So now instead of having one, like you would have in a Arabidopsis, you can have anywhere from uh, four, uh, you can have anywhere from three um, to uh, to four of these separate loci that are evolving independently um, or in trans from each other, and not constrained by any cis regulation that you might see in a Arabidopsis. And partially why we think that brassicas have a different uh, glucosinolate phenotype than we see in uh, Arabidopsis. Okay. So uh, just to wrap up, so the uh, across the Brassicaceae, including Macy, um, the, share, the shared origin for this MAM locus is also tied to duplication. So now we have expansion in the uh, cytochrome family as well as in uh, the origin of MAM at the beta duplication event. But it's the presence of this leucine dimer domain that allows for polypody events in the Brassicaceae to be significant to gene family expansion. Um, in future directions, I'd like to improve genomic sampling, so get some more genomes in the Cleomacy so we can look at some other cases that might be exceptions or uh, could help verify uh, the findings that we find here. Uh, and then also explore um, the effects of gene duplication on some of the other um, parts of the pathway, uh, assuming that uh, gene duplication is ruling everything in the Brassicaceae. Is, do we see that effect in other places, and then also looking again at the SIPs, since in the 2015 paper they just did a, a pairwise comparison between Arabidopsis and Carica, we're going to see if we can get a better picture of how uh, the cytochrome family was affected by uh, polypoidy uh, in the other families. Okay, uh, I'll take any questions. All right, well, thank you, Sean, for a wonderful talk. Um, as always, uh, let folks go ahead and put their questions in the chat box and uh, feel free to uh, pop up your uh, video and audio to ask your question directly to Sean. And I, I have, have a question, but I'll wait. <laughs> <laughs> I have to remember that my, that, because my camera turns, I, I don't see my camera, but I know you all see my camera, so I have to try not to. You know, this happens when I'm teaching. Uh, I have to make sure I'm not picking my nose in front of my students or anything like that. <laughs> <laughs> well, I have a real quick question I want to ask. So uh, do you have a sense of how fast after these uh, duplication events, whether they're the whole genome duplications or gene duplications, do you have a sense of how fast these new innovations in the glucosinolates are evolving? Is it happening really quickly or does it appear to take a long time or do you have no sense of that. I'm just sort of curious. Yeah, so I think the uh, it's so twofold. I think there are immediate effects, and we can kind of see that in um, in the tribrisisi with a lot of the the triangle U and and, and those where when you get a novel um, allopolypoid, for example, uh, resynthesized allopolypoid, you see immediate effects. But those are mostly in the regulation and in which tissues and and things like that that the um, profile, and then also 
some things that you might not call an innovation, but they're maybe an aberration, right? So you're, the way you change the network, accidents may occur in the biochemistry, accidents that may be adaptive in the future, but are just not there because of selection, but just because wires got sure. lost. Right, right, yeah. Um, but, you, uh, but to see um, particularly the, the conserved effects, yeah, that takes, um, that takes a few million years or, or so to, to get uh, those kinds of effects. Cool, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, All right, Nathaniel there. Yep, uh, so your question uh, is, uh, is there any sign of enzymatic promiscuity in duplicated genes? Um, so in, special, uh, in specialized metabolism, um, there is definitely um, a lot of enzymatic uh, promiscuity. And I can say, so for example, in this case, MAM, although it's known to work um, with uh, methionine-based uh, uh, amino acids, uh, so methionine amino acids and create methionine-based glucosinolates. Um, it also interacts with leucine and isoleucine and some other um, uh, valine amino acids, and there's some evidence um, for those. So they're definitely, uh, they touch a few different things and can add to a little bit more diversity. And I think definitely that promiscuity is part of the process of evolution and that like, oh, if this promiscuity is a little good, then we'll lean towards that. But if it's bad, then we can try and, uh, well, you won't survive if it's too bad, but yeah. Okay, uh, and Dong Ha uh, yep, asked Dong -ha. a question. Mm -hmm. Uh, do you have data or plan to relate the gene duplication and retention to metabolic profiles uh, and their adaptation, geological distribution, habitat characteristics? So we don't have um, we don't have broad uh, metabolic profiles. Luckily, there's a lot of um, chemiotaxonomic work. Uh, that was done on uh, families like the Brassicaceae. So we can, we can do a little bit of that in trying to associate changes, um, but we have to you know, take that with a grain of salt and, unless we're actually doing, um, the, uh, doing the LCMS ourselves because who knows what they left out or and things like that, uh, depending on how long you go back. So there, there are some general patterns we can get at, but again, these uh, glucosinolate profiles also vary a lot at the population level. Um, and so there's uh, only so much we can do at these deep phylogenetic scales without having incredible sampling across these groups. Um, so I do not have the data. Um, I, I hope it will exist one day, but I do not have the data now. Uh, and then uh, I believe this is Doug um, asks, similar to the question above, some functionalization. So do I have the... Um, data to address, uh, I guess, so to look at how sub-functionalization is changing the uh, metabolic profiles. So uh, this, there's probably a little bit more data. And in fact, in the paper, we cite um, one group, um, because glucosinolates are a big part of agriculture and agricultural development, there are a lot of people who are doing the specific molecular work to look at which like which amino acid and which, you know, shift in codon is affecting uh, the, the results in glucosinolate profile. Um, so we're able to connect this work and we see across some of the diversity in the different alleles of MAM um, to that work and say, okay, so this is a specific um, shift in uh, domain diversity that it could be tied to um, that, but it's all correlation um, and we would need someone to go in and, and confirm those associations. Thank you all so much. All right, yeah, wonderful. Thank you, uh, everybody. Uh, Paul, did you want to go back and, and work on and address Rob's talk? I haven't forgotten, um, <laughs> or Rob's question, or, uh, or not, if there's any other questions that people have about Paul or, or Sean's talks, now it's the chance to to ask them. Yeah, I can go back and address address that question. Um, 
if nobody else has anything they want to do first. Um, so I'll just repeat it just so we're all on the same page. Um, so the genome contributions for the two ancestors of Brassicanapus isn't equal. So um, the C genome has nine chromosomes and the A, chromosome, the a genome has 10 chromosomes. Uh, and so the question is, how is this affecting the site frequency spectrum and demography if there is unequal possibilities for recombination? Um, so yeah, I think this sort of ties into the difficulty in general of um, trying to make these inferences in polyploids and especially allopolyploids when there are different numbers of chromosomes is that you basically have different parts of the genome that are polyploid or diploid all at the same time. Um, and so as far as, so if somebody thinks differently than this, please say so in the chat, but, or go ahead and, and respond uh, in the, the call. But uh, I think that these things are all exist in the same organism. And so it's gonna experience demography in the same way. So if you have a big bottleneck, it doesn't really matter if you're tetraploid or diploid, there's still a bottleneck of some size. It'll just be sort of, you know, encoded in the DNA based on genetic variation based off of the local ploidal level for that particular region. And so um, I think one of the ways that you can move forward is you can sort of try and identify parts of the genome that are say all tetraploid or all diploid and then just do demographic inference using just those. And then, I mean, you would kind of hope that they agree because the difference is basically, it's a difference in, in how the variation is inherited from generation to generation and not so much a difference in the actual demography itself that is being experienced. Um, so I don't know if that is helpful in any way, but that's how I sort of try and think about it. And so um, I think basically what you would have to do is you can, you would have to find the parts of the A and C genomes that you could actually compare together and then either leave out the other parts that aren't capable of recombining because they are basically diploid. And if you have a tetraploid model, you can't include them directly in there. Um, or you can try and infer the demography using the diploid parts. And then if there are other parts that sort of have more, tetra, um, more tetraploid-like inheritance, you can try and use the inferred demography from the diploid to try and inform patterns of variation in the tetraploid parts. And so there's sort of like a synergistic back and forth, I think, if that makes any sense. Yeah, I'll just add that makes that makes sense to me. I, I, that's one way I would think about it as well. Um, yeah, I'm not sure if there's any other questions or comments on it, but. <laughs> well, thank, thanks, Paul. I, I wasn't sure what the answer should be. I mean, I think that's a tough question, so. Uh, but it, it struck me that you were talking about having you know, inferring the ploidy from these things with the with the, the genetic genetic variation or the read depth that you had, and that you were recovering some of the ancient polyploid as well as the more recent polyploid events in there, and that really seems to throw in some wrenches for thinking about the actual demography of an entity today because you're integrating over so much time with these multiple duplication events. So. Um, I yeah. wasn't sure how that interfaced with the sort of unequal contributions, the chromosome comp contributions of the two ancestors of that particular species either. But. Yeah. Yeah. So I think like in a perfect world, what I think would be the, if you could somehow like have all of your say reads mapping to your chromosomes, if you could simultaneously infer like, SNP ancestry based off of like expected patterns of ancient whole genome duplication to help infer the site frequency spectrum so that you're actually like calling SNPs in the same region across the different subgenomes. Um, like I'm sure there's some way to build some mega model that would do all of those things, but it would be probably really computationally intensive. And so trying to do sort of the bioinformatic legwork ahead of time, I think it's probably the more fruitful avenue first. But um, yeah, it's a tricky problem. Uh, 
All right. Well, um, I think with that, we'll wrap up today's uh, Polyploid webinar series. Uh, I want to thank both uh, Paul and Sean for two wonderful talks today uh, and a, a great kickoff to our fall uh, series here. Um, next, uh, the next webinar uh, will be on uh, in two weeks on uh, the uh, August 31st, and it will feature uh, two grad students, Claire McWhite and Christian Roman Palacios, talking about uh, both uh, the uh, uh, two different parts, of, again, a sort of polyploid research, uh, Claire presenting some work on proteomics, uh, and Christian talking about uh, recent work on uh, the phylogenetics and diversification uh, associated with polyploidy. Um, so be sure to tune in then uh, for uh, the, the next webinar. Um, and uh, I, we do have a few slots left this fall. I'm going to send out a few uh, focused invites. Um, but as always, the, it's an open uh, sign-up system. So if, if you should have received an email if you indicated that you're interested, uh, please go ahead. And if you uh, have a chance to take a look and you, you're interested in speaking, uh, look for that email in your inbox or reach out to me again, and I can uh, send you another link to the, uh, to the sign-up sheet. Um, but with that, I want to thank everyone for, for coming today. And again, thank our, our two speakers, uh, Paul and Sean. Um, and again, this this is uh, this posting. This video will be posted here uh, later on up on YouTube, so that folks can uh, go back and, and watch some of these uh, videos as always. Um, uh, but thanks. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, Mike. All right.